So you're very welcome to AWARE's June webinar. And this month, we're delighted to be in conversation with three men, and I'll introduce them in a few moments, but we'll just wait for everyone to get in. So we'll be starting very shortly. glasses on again so that's great just give another few moments for everyone to get in right we'll kick off so my name is Claire Hayes and I'm delighted to welcome you to AWARE's webinar monthly webinar series and this one our June one is a conversation with men about men's health. And I'm delighted to be welcoming in a little while Ke um, Stephen McBride and Keith Walsh and Joey Carberry. But first, I'd just like to give those of you who aren't familiar with AWARE or a webinar series a little bit of background information. So, first of all, AWARE, we provide mental health support services for, and wellbeing programs for anyone who's impacted by anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder. And this includes those people who support a loved one. We also have lots of mental health resources available and I encourage you to have a look at our website, aware.ie. So with International Men's Health coming up on Monday, we decided to focus today on male health with a specific focus on mental health. We invite you to submit questions in the question and answers box and only the panel will be able to see them. We also have people from AWARE backstage, Jamie and Karen, who will be gathering the questions and sending them to me and we will be then asking the panel. So we'll only be talking about people's personal perspectives today. And Stephen is a clinical expert. I'll ex um, talk to you about that in a few moments, but the others are going to be talking about their personal experiences. And we can't get to everything, but we'll answer the most relevant questions and the most commonly asked ones. And unfortunately, we cannot take questions after the webinar. What we've learned, and we're on a learning curve here, is every month people submit questions afterwards and we're just not able to go back to our panel experts and ask them and get back to people. So if anyone has any questions or difficulties or concerns after this in terms of your own well-being, we strongly encourage you to talk to your GP about them. So then let's start. So I'm delighted to welcome Stephen McBride and Stephen is Director of Services at AWARE. Stephen's also a psychotherapist himself. We have Joey Carberry and you might recognize Joey as a Munster and Ireland rugby player. And we have Keith Walsh and you might have come across Keith on social media over the last while. He's put out really important messages. He's a broadcaster and a mental health advocate. And we also have a contribution from Ms. Minister Simon Harris, Minister for Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science. Minister Harris was going to be with us present as some of you might be expecting. And unfortunately, the Doyle business, the government business came first and he's unable to be with us. But as in any really well-organized best occasion, he has sent a message. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves briefly, and then we will watch Ms. Ms. Minida, Minister Claire, makes sense, Minister Harris's video, and then we'll have a conversation with our three guests. So Stephen, maybe if I can ask you first, please, to introduce yourself sure. briefly. Thanks very much, Claire. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, my name is Steve McBride, and I'm the Director of Services here at AWARE. Uh, and I come from a background in, in psychotherapy, as Claire has uh, mentioned earlier. So I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist by uh, training, and I look forward to the conversation uh, this afternoon about men's health and how we can uh, look after ourselves as, as men in our relationships out there in the world. Uh, with other men and women. Uh, so let's see where, where the conversation brings us to in that regard. Great, thanks Stephen. Um, Joey, if you could introduce yourself briefly, please. 
Hi everyone, um, Joey Carby here. I play rugby with Munster in Ireland. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today with Keith and Stephen. And uh, yeah, like Stephen said, let's see where it brings us and we're looking forward to it. Great, thanks. And Keith? Yeah, uh, I'm a, my name is Keith Walsh, broadcaster and uh, former radio host. And uh, I work, currently work with uh, a, a company called Think House, or, um, a global advertising company and uh, I work there as creative director so I've recently completely done a career uh, uh, change pivot I suppose is the is the word that we'd use now that the the friends reunion um, has happened I can say the word pivot but yeah so um and over the last while uh, I've been talking about men's mental health things like therapy and just trying to make it part a normal part of a conversation just like fitness has become uh, in the last 20 years in Ireland, just a normal part of your day, normal part of your hygiene. And uh, that, that's very important to me. So I'm a mental health advocate. Great. OK, thank you, Keith and Stephen and Joey. And we'll have a look at Minister Harris's video now. But just to let you know, we've had some technical problems. We're not sure how well it's going to work. So we're not going to put everyone through three minutes of it not working. So we'll try for the first few 30 seconds and see how it goes. Hi everybody and thank you so much to AWARE for inviting me to take part in this important panel and events today on men's mental health. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you live today, but unfortunately this event is now clashing uh, with the Cabinet meeting. But I did want to send this message to show my support for this event and indeed to share some thoughts with you on mental health, men's mental health and the issue of resilience. I must say I'm honoured to be sharing a panel uh, with Keith and Joey and really want to thank them uh, for their leadership and their advocacy and for the attention that they're drawing is such an important topic in our country at such a crucial time in our country and in our world as people try and recover and rebuild post the COVID-19 pandemic. I think we've seen over the last year the most incredible show of resilience, of community spirit, of coming together and pulling together by all people right across this country. In many ways we've seen the best of Ireland, the best of community spirit, we've seen that metal that we talk about so much in our country. And in many ways, people have described that as resilience. People have faced the most horrifically difficult times and they have shown a huge resilience, perhaps a resilience that they didn't even know they had. But I just want to share a few thoughts with you. I think what the pandemic has shown is the link between physical health and mental health is so clear for all to see. We all know how much we enjoy getting out for that exercise, even if we got fed up walking that same five kilometers over and over again, because our physical health and our physical well-being was so linked to our mental health and well-being. I think we also saw a much greater awareness of mental health, people talking about it more in the country. And I think that in and of itself is important. But we do also have to be honest. There is still too much of a stigma attached to discussing mental health issues. And perhaps that stigma is even more acute when we talk about men's mental health. There is still sometimes this macho view uh, that people have to say, oh, I'm all right, and plough on, when people are feeling extremely fragile. So I think the more we talk about mental health, I think the more we can help each other and the more indeed we can help our country uh, become a place where we foster positive mental health. Resilience is something that's so important and I'm so proud of everyone in this country and the resilience that we've all shown individually and collectively over the course of the last year and a half. But sometimes I think resilience can be used as a bit of a buzzword and sometimes it can maybe paper over the fact that people are feeling very fragile for a whole load of different reasons. The last year plus has been an extremely difficult time and I think we have to be honest with each other. It's going to take time for our country to get back to some degree of normality. It's going to take time for all of us to readjust. I'm meeting people who, even though they're looking forward to going back to normal, still have an anxiety about that, about actually having to re-emerge and socialise and reconnect, an anxiety and a concern about work and the future work prospects. These are all normal things. And that phrase, which I know has become a bit hackneyed at times, but that it's okay not to be okay, does ring true because we are going to get through this together, but it is going to take time. And I really want to thank everybody in AWARE for the work that you're doing, for the work that you're doing day in and day out in providing help and support to all of us. Mental health isn't something over there. It's not something that affects somebody else. It's something that affects each and every one of us. And mental illness is something that can visit each and every one of us at a stage in our life just like physical illness. So please keep doing what you're doing aware and please know that we stand full square behind you 
in helping promote your vision of living in a country where we foster an environment of positive mental health. I hope the webinar today goes really well and thank you so much uh, for giving me these few moments. Gormagot. There's a saying in Irish, too smite lana hibre, a good beginning is half the work. So I'm certainly taking a deep sigh of relief now that our video worked. The picture was a little bit out of sync with the sound, but we could certainly hear Minister Harris's message loud and clear. And on behalf of AWARE, I'd really like to thank Minister Harris for taking the time to make the video and to contribute today. So Stephen, if I can ask you first, he, Minister Harris mentioned their stigma, he mentioned resilience. One thing as you would know when we were planning this is our previous webinar in May was on the menopause. I presume none of the three of you were watching, but maybe you were. But we had three times as much key engagement right through a week ago, there were three times more people who were interested three times more people signed up and then are watching this today. Why is that? Why is, why is there less interest in a conversation on men's mental health than women? It's a very interesting question, Claire. Yeah, and obviously I'd be aware of the figures that uh, signed up for the uh, last month's webinar around the menopause. And here we are talking about men's health and men's mental health. And I was thinking about it in, in the context, I suppose, of how perhaps from a, a male perspective and as a man, you know, that self-reliance is, is more treasured or more seen to be a, a, a virtue to hold on to or to, um, to embody in one's life, you know, that uh, the idea of coping alone and actually there can be quite a cost in that. Now, I don't know if there's a direct correlation between that necessarily and, uh, you know, two thirds less of a figure signing up for this month's webinar. But I suppose speaking as, as a man, there is something of that around, uh, and, and perhaps it's more uh, prevalent in Western societies about how self-reliance and coping alone is, is, is virtued. And I, I think there can be a cost in that, even though there's, you know, this is the kind of counterintuitive nature of it, that it's, it's beneficial to be able to cope and to have this resilience that Minister Harris spoke to as well. So I was wondering a little bit about that uh, in the sense of, um, these two webinars, you know, uh, May's one and now uh, this one, and, and what might be going on in that regard. Yeah, thanks. And Joey or Keith, is there anything that you'd like to say in response to Minister Harris has said or thoughts that you, um, maybe if I go with you, Joey, first, and Keith, I'm not leaving you last, the best to last, as you know, but so I'll ask each of you and then look, it's organic. So if I, if any of you want to come in, do, but maybe if I can ask you first, Joey, and then come to you, Keith. Yeah, I thought Minister Harris's uh, messages were very spot on. I suppose the last 15, 16 months have been extremely tough for everyone. Um, not being able to see people, I know from a personal level, um, I, I'm very social and what helps my mental health the most and um, would be to see people and meet people. And uh, I suppose during the pandemic, we weren't able to do that. So I think everyone has shown great resilience to get to where we are now and um, things are starting to get look up. So uh, yeah, I think the, the message is spot on and it just shows how strong of a country we are when we pull together and we can get through anything. Okay, thank you. And Keith? Yeah, it's it's interesting that, you know, the, the numbers of men who are, you know, interested in having this conversation and the stigma attached to it. And, and it, it's going to take a long time. Like I always use the example of of jogging in Ireland. Like when I was, Joe, you won't remember this, but when I was a young man, people didn't jog. You know, if you saw someone jogging, they were either in an athletic club or they were, you know, they were training for a, a marathon or they're running away from somebody. Um now you see people, I see people every day. I live in Newbridge and County Kildare. I see people out in the evening, they're walking, they're jogging, there's groups of them, there's all different levels. There's 50 year old ladies in their, in their groups of three or four out for their jog. There's, you know, these, you see these like athletic clubs, the numbers are up. Like people, I, I can remember myself going to Australia for the first time as a young man and just seeing people out doing exercise and just being amazed. That wasn't our country. We didn't do that. We didn't look after our health, our physical health. I'm kind of hoping, I, I think it was due to people traveling and coming back and it was people like me or the people who, who left in the 80s and came back, uh, you know, to America and Australia. We, they came back with these habits of exercising and getting out and about and getting fresh air and all that kind of stuff. And that all helps your mental health as well. So I am hoping that things are changing and that with people like 
the likes of Joey and, and myself and uh, Brezzy and, you know, talking about it, that it is changing. But at the moment, we're not there yet. Uh, people are still kind of embarrassed to be associated with, like, like you might have been embarrassed to go out for a run in the 80s. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, it's, it's a mindset change. Um, and, and, and yes, we are bad at asking for help, especially the men and, and the women as well. But women tend to talk to each other and share a bit more and, and they will go to their mothers or their friends or, or, or talk to their husbands. Um, the problem is sometimes the husbands are, are so preoccupied, they're not listening. But we, we, we don't, we don't talk to our friends because it is that thing of you're, you are expected to man up, you're expected to grow a pair, you're expected to deal with the situation Mm -hmm. And that's bad because we often you'll find men back themselves into a corner and they can be asked a question again and again, is everything OK? And of course, men with, with men, everything's grand. Everything's always grand. And, you know, it's, it's a great word that we use here in Ireland where we just say everything's grand. And suddenly, you know, the finances aren't grand or the job isn't grand and you don't like going to work every day. And no, you're not happy in your, your circumstances, but you haven't told anybody. And you haven't shared that with anybody, but you're trying to cope. And then all of a sudden you just can't cope any longer. It, it just, mm -hmm. it's gone too far. We've backed ourselves into a corner and that's what we really need to look at. Mm -hmm. So for anybody saying that like, there's, there's too much talk about anxiety or there's too much talk about stress or there's too much talk about mental health. It's only making people have anxiety and mental health. Mm -hmm. That's false. And that's not a fact. It, like it, it's, we, we just need to, it's okay to talk about it. It's all mm -hmm. right to say that you're struggling. And that's the point we're trying to get across. Um, and I think to I concur with that, Keith. And, and I think just to add, add on to it, something of that, you know, it's the idea that, and, and I liked listening to you talk about normalizing the idea of therapy or counseling or reaching out for support. And it's the idea that if, if a man is to uh, reveal something of himself around a struggle he's having, that it's not about necessarily opening up about his, as darkest fears or deepest struggles. It's the idea that uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily uh, emotional support per se. It's a mixture of emotional support as well as the practical support, which can alleviate these feelings of anxiety and stress, whether as you mentioned, it's about a financial uh, concern or whatever, you know, uh, bereavement, uh, anxiety around that, all the natural and normal things that happen to us all in our lives and, and reaching out and, and finding some of that support with a uh, loved one or a friend, you know, can, can be so rich and beneficial about what comes back to you, you know, by revealing yeah, that kind of idea of self-revelation. Yeah, and I think that the, it's, it's only when the, when the proverbial hits the fan that we, we suffer. And like, like Joey would be able to relate to this. I was talking to somebody recently who plays a lot of sport and she's been injured and she struggled if you're a young lad and you're playing sport and everything's fine and you're and you're going great guns and you're getting picked for the team and everything's fine that's all fine you don't really need to deal with your you don't feel like you need to deal with your mental health because you're getting your you're getting uh, uh your satisfaction from playing your game from getting picked you know everything's good everyone likes you everyone's talking to you but then suddenly if you get injured or you're you're suddenly your form you know you, you lose form for a while nobody wants to know as much you you know you aren't as important to people and 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 it's directly linked then to your ability to play a sport or to, or to do your job or whatever it is and that's when we we that's when we need to talk and and if we're not talking all along and then when, when something like that happens i'm sure joy can attest to this that's that's when the, the you know the doo doo hits the fan you know mm -hmm. yeah i com i completely agree with you kate i think um having experienced an injury where I was out for 15 months. And um, like you said, Keith, when everything's going well, you, you kind of take for granted um, the highs and the lows of sport. And then when it's taken away from you and there's nothing you can really do about it, it is, it's a tough place to be. And um, I think that's why sport is such a good, I find anyway, it's such a good release for me. Um, so being back playing, it's really made me appreciate the highs and lows of everything. And I suppose you can take the highs and lows of sport and then completely correlate it to the highs and lows of life as well. Um, I do think you have to appreciate mm -hmm. when the times are good. Um, I know for me, I'm appreciating every, every, good, every good game and every good training at the moment for it being taken away and then the lows as well. But um, I do think, like you said, I'm very lucky to be part of a team and some of those guys in the team would be my best friends so 
I can talk to them on a daily basis. I can chat to my girlfriend and I found that was the biggest thing for me when times were tough and um, I almost couldn't see through some days where I'd go in and nothing was working and the only relief I could get was by chatting to people and I think the injury unfortunately happened when it did but I have so many learnings from it now that I'm, I feel like I'm better for it. I'm, I'm just struck listening to you that there's there are a lot of myths about this so one is men don't talk you three have no problem in talking so is it that men don't talk when women are around or that women just keep going and don't make it a, a men women thing but the, I give a, a talk an input at the plowing championship a few years ago on behalf of AWARE and um, for men, men's mental health. And about seven women turned up and no men. And when I talked to the then president of the Irish Country Women's Association, the ICA, they were down there as well. They said they were there to talk about men's physical safety on the farms. And that what they had found was that the way that the men would listen was through the women. So preaching to men or talking to men and maybe the, the, the word preaching, but talking to men about keeping safe on the farm wasn't working. But once they went through the women, then they listened. I, I think that's a myth too. I mean, what would you, the three of you really like young men and older men to get from this webinar today, from this conversation in terms of managing, supporting their mental health? Well, I mean, don't be afraid to turn around to whoever will listen to you. you. You don't always, the first person you turn around and talk to might not be the right person to talk to. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're getting the, if you're not getting, if you're getting the vibes that somebody you're talking to doesn't care, move on, find somebody else, you know. Um, I would always be an advocate of professional help. And, and I'm a, I, I would see a therapist. I, I went through a period for about a year and a half where I saw a therapist every week. And now it, that's been pushed out every six weeks or, you know, two months, whenever I feel like I want to check in. Um, so don't be afraid to put up your hand and say, listen, um, I could do it some advice. It's, it's it, for men. Look, it's advice on mental health. I contacted a friend of mine when um, when the first lockdown happened, I got in touch with a friend of mine who, who lives abroad and he's away from his family and he's away from parents and sisters. And, you know, things weren't going well with the wider family. His dad wasn't well, his sister wasn't well. He was stuck sort of working from home and had no couldn't travel to help them, couldn't, you know, felt felt kind of, I suppose, trapped and useless, like, well, I can't do anything, but, you know, and I could tell by talking to him that he could do a talking to somebody. And I said, look, would you, if I send you a number, and the great thing about uh, um, COVID and all that is that now you can just see your therapist on, on Zoom, doesn't matter where you are. So I recommended a local guy here in Kildare. And uh, I said, look, will you check in with this lad? And he kind of, my friend got annoyed with me. And he said, what, he said, what's he going to do? Get rid of COVID. And it's not about getting rid of COVID. It's not about getting rid of the problem. It's about talking to somebody who can help you figure out a way out of the problem. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with COVID? How do you deal with the problem? How do you deal with the job? It's not about walking away. It's about figuring out a way for you personally, because everyone deals with it differently. What are your skills? What are your traits? How can you best approach this? How is your hygiene? How's your sleep? How's your physical uh, uh, activity. What you know? What what can you do, and what can we nurture here in you, for you to? Be, and and I suppose to talk to men, it's about if you if you if you if you if you've got to play a sport, if you're going to play a sport, you've got to tra train for it. If you want to deal with an issue, you've got to train for it. You've got to be ready. You've got to, you know, make sure you've got the right weaponry, you know, the right physical attributes to deal with the whatever it is, COVID or being made redundant what are you going to do you know you kind of in one way you are on your own but another mm -hmm. way you can talk to that can tell you well look you have these skills and if you create this scenario and if you think in this way and if you talk about it like there are there are people can help you with, discover your tools uh, to deal with 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 the problems you know and that's all it is and i was thinking about that in the context of allowing once allowing yourself or ourselves as men and speaking as a man obviously you know to be vulnerable you know, and, and again, it's it's not this position of having to reveal every last thing, but it, it, it can be as, uh, as as shorter term or as longer term. And you've alluded to your own uh, journey and that, Keith, you know, about revealing yourself, you know, whether it's in a, in a professional capacity or with our loved ones. Because I was thinking about the word, you know, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and the word around being uh, emotionally intimate or intimate intimacy, you know, and how that makes sense because that creates the, the kind of space, I think, 
for uh, all human beings and, and obviously as, as men to be to be known a little bit more and that fosters a, a deeper connection in relationships because we're all social beings you know we're all we're born to relate in the world and and how we can uh, uh, further develop that you know that social connectedness through uh, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable as is appropriate and as this feels safe to you Okay, there's a few questions coming in and really one for each of you that I'll come back to in a moment. But Joey, what message would you like people watching this to get? Just that it's okay um, to have bad days um, and to feel, to, to sometimes just not feel great. Um, and like Keith said, I, I always like to think of it as you, you have a gearbox um, like driving a car where when things are good, you're in gear one, but when things are bad, you, you need to use the tools and get to gear five um, and be able to use the tools that you've, you've worked on. And uh, I, I, I'm the same. I've chatted to a therapist over my injury um, and I felt that even just if it was a general chit chat about the weather and it helps. Um, so being able to chat with him and discuss what, what I need to do and uh, what I need to bring out of myself when times are tough, um, that really helped me to um, see past a few things. And um, yeah, I suppose that's one thing I'd love for it to be more um, accepted. Joey, there's a particular question for you. So I'll ask you just while you, while you have the floor. So question for Joey, do you feel that the skills you acquired as a professional sports person transferred readily when dealing with taking care of your own mental health, given physical health is so crucial for a sports person? Yeah, definitely. Um, I suppose to relate to that question, um, in a game you might be losing um, and it might be frantic and you might need to compose yourself, compose the guys around you and get back on track to where, where the team's, how the team's playing. And I suppose that's directly correlated to, to life. Um, like he said, you could be made redundant and the, you might, your back might be against the wall, but being able to keep a a level head um, just to keep seeing rationally uh, is massive as it, it, it's a big indication to what your, ne your next step is going to be. And it might be your, your most important step. So I do believe that there's a massive correlation between what happens in sport and what happens in life. And I suppose being able to be resilient as well. And when the times are tough to keep, to keep going through and uh, to be able to ask for help is a big thing as well. Um, I believe that's a massive thing. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I would say. Yeah. Okay. I, Thank you. I, 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 I just like to take, just, yeah, go on, Keith. Just what Joey said about the next step, like that's so important. If you you need to break it down because, and I, I I've been there, and I would have been in a scenario where I would have just thought everything it's too much. It's too much for me to deal with. There's too many things going wrong here. I can't deal with them. But when you when you you know if you talk to a therapist or if you can manage to get into a place where you can be more mindful or, or you know or meditate or any of that kind of stuff it teaches you to just just take the right next step and then then deal with the step after that afterwards it's very important to break things down like that it, it very similar to that scenario in sport Keith if I can just stay with you then and then there's a question for you Stephen as well the specific but um, somebody's written in and said hi as a man and a father I struggle with being a father who cares for and is strong for my children and being able to say when I am not good I feel I should be caring for them and not the other way around how would you react to that yeah like I mean the thing about it is with a family in a family unit we've always traditionally the father is the, the head of the household and then everybody sort of like you know files in under that I mean it's not it's not the truth because a lot of the time women run the household um but the way I approach it, and I would have had my struggles with my family and, and feeling like an outsider, you know, I, I would have had moments where my wife and children were laughing and fooling and, you know, proper belly laughing. And I would have just felt like I, I can't, I'm not involved because my emotions were so locked up. I just wasn't, I didn't have the ability. I didn't have the tools to just enjoy that moment. Um, but sort of through, through the work I've done on myself, like we have a sort of a situation, like the problem is dads, men, we come into different situations as different people. So we're in work, we're a different guy. We come home, we're, we're dad. We, we, we were out in the football pitch playing five aside with the lads. We're in the pub, we're, we're Keith or we're, we're Stephen or we're Joey. We're different people in different places. The trick is to try and be yourself. 
this is the one thing that therapy really helped me with was to drill down into me and who I really was and try and be that person all the time. And it's been difficult for me because now I'm sort of having trying to foster new relationships with my kids and that I'm behaving differently. And it's 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 awkward for them. I'm behaving differently with my wife. It's awkward for her. But they're slowly getting used to it. it it's just things change. You start, I'm, I've decided that I'm going to be the same person in every scenario. If I go to work, I'm going to be me. If I go, if I'm at home, I'll, I'll be me. And it's allowed me to be able to share the funny thing, the, the, the things that I find funny in life. I can share that with my kids because I'm just Keith, just sharing a funny moment with them. I'm not dad trying to be, I mean, you obviously you've got to be responsible and, and you know, and you've got to guide them as well, but you know, you, you can only do so much of that. But at the same time, you owe it to yourself to be yourself with your kids. And then that will allow them to see that they can be themselves with you and not, and they, they can bring themselves into the house the same way they are with their friends. And I see my son now more as his friends see him than I would have before, because I've allowed him to see me as who I really am. And it's important to think about these things. Who are you to the people around you? What way do you behave around them? Are you closed off to them? Do you share things? Do you talk to them? Do you listen, more importantly? And do you allow them to make mistakes and not be judgmental? Because if you are judgmental of the people around you, they won't tell you anything. And then you're locking yourself out of your own life. And also if you're judgmental of yourself and maybe being hard on yourself and this idea of supposed to be strong as a father or as, as a man, that, that, that adds or heaps an extra layer of pressure. And uh, in some regards, you know, it's societally driven, you know, about the, uh, the strong uh, man and, and whether that's about, about a man in the family, you know, in the, in the heterosexual understanding of it or not. You know, but that as a father figure, um, how strength uh, vul- strength comes from vulnerability and allowing yourself to to get to know yourself as Keith is attesting to, and 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 also kind of thinking about what way you want to be in that position of the father and uh, speaking to your loved ones about it. And so Sue, you're, you're in the role of as a father in the position as a father, and you're also a psychotherapist. So separating out and, you know, other people are whatever jobs men have, separating that out and being, being the father. Mm. How, re, how do you manage that? And there's a specific question for you. So maybe if I ask you the question too, and then you can, um, can answer it in whatever way you want. So for those people who are more resilient and don't suffer from mental health issues, how can I explain lack of resilience and the practical daily aspects of difficulty with men's mental health and also how others can help to family, friends and also managers, employers? I struggle with explaining my mental health issues to people. I'd also be interested in the panel's reaction or practical experiences. Is that a question that's for me, Claire? That's a question for you, Stephen, but also the one about being a dad as well. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, to go back to, to that first bit, it's kind of trying to forget in a, in a strange way, you know, uh, that I'm not my children's psychotherapist. So it's almost a disadvantage knowing some of what I know and what I practice in my work life and have practiced in my training. You know, I'm their father, not... You know, so it's trying and it's not compartmentalizing it. It's it's kind of allowing both in rather than one or the other, but taking on the, the position of uh, their father uh, in, in, a, in a healthy way or in as healthy way as possible, uh, while realizing that the stuff that I do know to do with uh, my training and work life is relevant, but not uh, the, the central aspect of it, I suppose. And then I was thinking about the, the second aspect of, of the question or the second question, Claire, and I was thinking about it in, it, it sounds as though that behind that question, there might be some kind of an internal judgment about not feeling as though, so this idea that the person who's asking the question is saying that they're not resilient or feel as though they're less resilient maybe than other people. And uh, I wonder how that's been defined, you know, and, and how... Uh, their understanding of that maybe uh, is, is a little bit off or something. And by that, I mean kind of not as accurate as it could be because in d- just the sense of that it being um, kind of a little bit judgmental and if you feel a l- bit less resilient, what you might do to kind of think about, uh, you know, again, it's back to what we've been talking about, how you feel as though you can open that conversation with people that you're close to, you know, in uh, as... Um, gently as possible you know and how you can foster some compassionate relationships and maybe that's not exclusively with your partner or uh, with a family member that that friends are so central to it too 
Yeah, um, there's a response here as well from one of the participants, uh, some, somebody attending the webinar. As a father of three boys, I find it extremely helpful that you have spokespeople that kids can relate to outside the, the family network. High profile young people like Joey and Brezzy are key in my opinion. And, and Joey, the question, if, which I absolutely agree with, if you look at the Vodafone advert at the moment, you can see how society promotes the phrase, I'm grand, sure you know yourself. So somebody saying we need to move beyond when we say we're not okay, what does that actually mean? What supports does this mean that the person needs? And um, so in work, when they say they're not okay, or if they've had a mental health difficulty or illness and they're returning to work. So that that's very broad, but you're in the, the macho world, if, if I can use that word, where people, possibly some men are saying, I am grand and, and they're not. Yeah, I definitely think it comes back to having the strength and being honest enough with yourself to realize that things aren't uh, grand as as you said um i think it's the easy answer a lot of the time um and I, I suppose having the strength to be able to understand that something's even if you don't know what's wrong but just being able to realize something isn't right and being able to ask for the help of someone um is massive like it's incredibly tough thing to do I know with my injuries and um, I tried to pretend I was okay uh, I tried to pretend I wasn't injured and I'd be like no I'll be fine I'll go out and train and end up doing more damage so I, I from I think it's 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 a lot easier to just say no I'm okay um, and I think it's it's uh, something that we all need to get better at is being able to say no something's up here I need to do a bit more research I need to ask someone who might know and um, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a skill that we need to we need to get better at, and it only comes with practice, really. Thank you. And um, there's another question for you, Joy, but um, I'll ask you that just when when you're there. Um, were there supports within the team and organisation structure that were of help to you, and are they available, or could they be replicated for the general public? Yeah, um, I suppose, like I said earlier, I'm privileged enough to be part of a, a team, and some of them will be my best friends, but. I don't think there's anyone within the organization who I couldn't go to and ask and they wouldn't do their utmost best to help me. Um, so there was obviously that close circle. Um, I had my girlfriend, Robin, who I suppose I probably tell her the ins and outs of every day. Um, then my family, a uh, huge part. But then I, I, I was lucky enough, like I said, the monster, the doc, uh, he put me in contact with a therapist who I was able to chat to and, um, I found him to be someone who's completely attached from my environment um, was very helpful. But um, I suppose having people ask me the whole time, was I okay, uh, was a big thing for me because some days, like you said, it was just a habit where I'd say it's grand. And then it got to the point where I was so sick of just saying that that I was like, no, I need to do something here. Um, and I would sit down and I would chat with someone and afterwards I felt so much better about it. So, yeah, there's definitely people out there you can talk to. Um, and I suppose it can be replicated through in the everyday life. Um, and it just comes from the people around you and you, you yourself being honest and putting your hand up saying, I need some help. I'm really conscious as, as I'm listening to you that there's individual differences, you know, so you are each representing yourself rather than men in general. And there's cultural differences and Ireland as a society has changed. And one of the questions or the comments that we've got in is just reminding us that in the traveler community that they, men find it difficult and see themselves that they can't let themselves down so if they talk about that they're not okay it can be seen as letting themselves down because they're the keepers in the family so that they might never get help when they need it as I think then if they do they're not going to be able to support their families if they fall down and, and Keith I can ask you a specific question and I'm conscious this is coming into question and answers rather than a, a, a fluid as you said Stephen conversation is is that okay with you and you can each nod if it is um, I'm just conscious of people wanting questions and and the questions I've asked you up until now have all been from men that last comment was from a woman and um Keith a, a, a woman has has asked would you suggest someone should approach a man if they feel they're struggling mentally or leave it to the man to talk the, to them if needed? And that might be depending on the man and depending on the woman. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's very difficult um, for, I mean, I can only talk about my own personal situation and I was um, <clears throat> the, the kind of the, 
as I keep saying, like for me, the the reason I went to therapy was because I was I, I'd been presenting the breakfast show on Two FM for five years. We've been quite successful, and suddenly it came to an end. and And I would say that it was kind of not of my own doing. In that, like these things happen, you know. It's not that's that's show business. It's you know it works like that. You know things shows finish up and. But I felt a, tr- a tremendous sense of rejection. I felt a tremendous sense of just not being good enough. I felt, and also I was a bit lost and I was kind of in my forties, like, what do I do now? Where do I go next? What's, you know, and, I, and this was all kind of like weighing on me. And it was, I suppose I was lucky in that my wife, she suggested, and this is how men's heads work. So this could help answer the question. You know, I was sort of thinking, well, I've got some, I've got a bit of time here. This show is finished up. I've got a bit of leeway. Uh, you know, how do I make, make sure that I'm the best version of myself for when the next challenge comes along? That was kind of like in my head. I was like, I was making sure I was eating right and I was, you know, going to the gym and keeping myself fit and all this kind of stuff. I gave up booze at one point um, and I, I haven't drank since. But my wife actually said to me, would you consider talking to somebody? And straight away in my in my in, in my head, because I'm a man, I was thinking, yes, excellent. That's the one thing I haven't thought about. He can tell me what to do from like a psychotherapist point of view, because I didn't know, you know, but he could he can box, you know, that's that boxed off. I've got the, you know, I'll keep fit. I'll make sure I'm eating right. And then he's going to tell me what I what I can do. You know, I was it was almost like I was handing it over to him. So I was happy enough to go to see him. Uh, thinking, well, this guy's going to just point me in the right direction and tell me what to do. He's going to give me all the, you know, I didn't know that he was going to talk to me and tease it out of me. And actually, I was going to answer the questions myself. I didn't really know, you know, I expected to go into the therapist, like almost like a man with a clipboard and a white coat and, you know, sort of a, you know, roundy glasses, much like myself and and pole face. But, you know, I, I went into a guy called Luke and he was wearing a big woolly jumper and cords and, you know, he just kind of sat there and listened to me. And, you know, it, ultimately, I started answering my own questions. It's not something to be afraid of. It's just a safe space to talk. But but it was my wife who said it to me. And and if somebody is saying, and, and, and I, yeah, I, it, it's difficult. How do you approach and how do you say it to somebody? But maybe for a man, if you can approach and say, look, you've, you know, you've got you've got all the tools here. Maybe just kind of have a look at uh, what's going on uh, in the head and see, see how, how, how that is. I would always say, yeah, do it, try it. it there's no harm. In, and, and they might, might not react properly uh, and positively straight away. Mm. But I guarantee you, the way men work, he will think about that. And he might at some point revisit that suggestion. Sure. Don't leave the elephant in the room being the elephant. If you, know, if you have a, a, a good, an, an urge to say something, you know, um, even though there might be a kind of unintended consequence that might be uh, difficult to receive backwards is to is to speak to it, you know, speak to your, as spontaneously as possible. And um, yeah, that would be my sense of it, you know, in, in, in a relationship, just to check in, in the spirit of how are things going, you know, are you doing okay, you know? And I know uh, eventually, as you uh, alluded to, uh, Joey, you know, being asked, are you okay on a daily basis over and over, you know, sometimes that, you know, as you say, the penny drops, he says, right, I have to do something. But perhaps it'll come, the, res- the positive response will come the first or second time you're asked. It, it depends on the person. Uh, been asked the question doesn't it and yeah i think as well like things like suggesting podcasts uh mm. is a great way of you know because as we, as we said at the start we're, we're very much men are still we're very much in a place where we don't want to talk about the fact that we might have worries about our mental health but suggesting podcasts you know if my you know if you have a partner or your wife suggests oh if you listen to the latest sort of brazy podcast or if you're you know something that might be a bit more spiritual than they're used to listen to something on, on, on mindfulness. The big, the big thing for me and the big thing I got out of therapy and Stephen mentioned earlier, earlier was the word vulnerability and like being vulnerable. I thought, I thought being vulnerable meant not wearing your, 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 uh, your helmet onto the hurling field or not wearing your, um, your gum shield onto the rugby pitch, you know, but, but the, it's, it's the ability to allow yourself, as Joey said, to tell somebody you're, you're not feeling okay Mm. Uh, and Mm. you know in a safe place just say look i I, i'm i am struggling here and i found that once i mean it was funny because my therapist had to explain to me what vulnerability meant and i was like i I didn't really get it but after a few sessions i was like okay and and then i was like so it's okay for me to go back to my wife and saying i'm not sure about x y and z or you know i think that this might be an issue or you know to be honest with her it took her a while to to sort of figure out this new man in her life who was being honest you know and, and you have to give the people in your mm-hmm. in your in your life uh, time as well to get used to the changes but vulnerability for me 
once I understood what vulnerability mean and meant and being vulnerable, it unlocked this whole world of then I was able to be mindful. Then I was able to think about meditation. Then I was able to think about knocking the booze on the head. Then I was able to, but there was that first step of like Joey mm. said, of being vulnerable and, and do, do a little, do a little, do try a small bit of vulnerability and then a bigger bit yeah. of vulnerability and build on that. So like if Joey is able to say, yeah, look, I'm not feeling and have a quick chat with somebody about how they're actually feeling. That's opening the door a little bit. And then you can do more of that. And it doesn't have to be a big, like, you know, you don't have to go onto social media and tell everybody, you know, all your troubles straight away. It's just sure. bit by bit, be a little bit vulnerable, be a little bit more vulnerable. And that goes back to the other questions we were asked about, be vulnerable around your children. You know, you can tell them you don't have all the answers as well. And that creates a different relationship there as well. Keith, you've answered a few questions that have come in. One was, does anybody in the panel practice mindfulness? And you've mentioned that. Also, what do you mean about being real, about being, being yourself? And I think you've, you've answered that in terms of expanding on the vulnerability piece. And there's a question that's come in that has ended. The last sentence jumped out because it's in capitals. And it says, in capitals, great to see Joey back on the pitch. So just to, to pass that one on. And that's from somebody who's asking, saying that COVID hasn't been too difficult, but this, that's mental health difficulties over the last 10 years and um, describes a little bit of his own experiences in terms of medication and so on. And his question is, would um, any of you be able to adv give advice on dealing with paranoia if they've ever dealt with it or come across in, in, in other walks of life? So somebody who might think that um, he's, he's describes his illness has made him very paranoid, so which he's trying to control. Yeah, I, I suppose I can speak to that, uh, Claire, perhaps, you know, I, yeah. I think in, in relation to, to paranoia is that to try and, and um, you know, not to take the heat out of that ex person's experience of it, but, you know, that we, we can all experience it, you know, the sense of, um, you know, we often do an exercise here in relation to uh, the impact on people's thinking and then behavior if they ha a neighbor ignores them or they perceive the neighbor to ignore them. And one of our skills and exercises around uh, examining your thinking process, isn't it, around the experience of a, a friend or a neighbor ignoring you or you per your perception that they've ignored you. So I think one of the antidotes to kind of if paranoia is taking root is to try and examine some of your thinking and examine the evidence for it. And there's a, a tangible way of doing that, of even getting out an A4 piece of paper and writing down, you know, your thoughts about it and what is um, what, genuine and real. And obviously your perception of the event is that for in that instance, as I'm um, putting the the example out you know that the, you might really feel as though the neighbor is ignoring you but what are you going to do to kind of counter that kind of growing evidence in your head so that's the bigger risk isn't it to try and challenge the paranoia rather than letting it take root I don't know maybe maybe yeah. other Joey or Keith or yourself even Claire have a different I, sense I, of that I, I'm going to come to Joey if that's okay because I'm conscious of time and we've had loads and loads and loads of questions but there's one here that I, I'm struck by that a lot of people are particularly in the sports world are talking about their own experiences their own challenges and yeah. somebody's concerned about yes but could that backfire and could there be a judgmental piece and it's important to choose the right person so Joey you've very generously agreed to become an ambassador of AWARE and volunteered to become an ambassador for AWARE and I know this is our, our start and we're so thrilled to have you have you experienced any um, fallback or a, a negative response to you being so upfront about the importance of men addressing their mental health? Definitely not. Um, I think it's I think it's a topic where I think it was mentioned earlier where when initially it is mentioned, men might react in a way that they have to come back to it and think about it again. And then they're like, hang on, hang on, they're actually onto something there. Um, I think it's a point that men just overlook it. And the more we talk about it and the more it's recognized, the more it seems to make sense to people. Um, and I think the, the awareness of what actually is mental health is probably not there um, within some people. Um, so yeah, the, the more... I've kind of been exposed to it and the more I've chatted to people about it, it's kind of like an awakening where they're like, okay, maybe they might, they might react 
not hostile at the start, but they're, they're not as keen on it at the start. But then the, the more they think about it and the more they appreciate it, then I think it is a, a topic where people are a lot more interested in. And um, I suppose that's a big reason for me coming on this is my um, personal experience allowed me to see things differently and, uh, and, and almost uh, a new outlook on things. Um, and I'd love to be able to share that and help people um who are in tough times um mm. so yeah that's i think that's a it's it's definitely something that is growing and it's getting people become more aware of it uh excuse the pun but yeah it is it's uh definitely getting better mm. we, we've got quite thank you we've got quite a lot of comments about the impact of the three of you talking about this conversation is is having and um, a lot of people thanking you for it somebody who was explaining that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and since he was 17, 15 or 16 and back then nobody talked about it. So the difference in terms of this conversation and it'll be recorded. So my hope is that young men, older men, teenagers will really gain from it. And we've got a question that I can answer and it's been asked, what would we recommend for people who can't afford therapy? And I'd encourage people to have a look at AWARE's website because there are resources there that are free of charge. There's um, cognitive behavioral therapy courses, life skills. There's uh, support groups. There is support line. There is a really detailed website with a database of lectures and webinars that people can access and resource. And of course, the number one is always for people to go to their GP. Um, there's so many questions that we're not going to be able to address. What did the panel think about the connection between egotism and, um, I'm not pronouncing that properly, um, egotism and the competitive spirit? Um, comment hearing Keith and Joey talk so openly about the vulnerabilities, really, really helpful talking about the language, taking the stigma out. So I'm going to just give each of you sort of 30 seconds, if that's okay, to say maybe one thing that you would really like to emphasize in terms of men, a conversation about men, about the mental health. And Stephen, if I can come to you first. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, I was just thinking and, and trying to generate a few thoughts in my head following on from the conversation. I think two things come to mind and I was tuning into what, uh, you know, uh, Keith said about the idea of physical health and going for jogs. And I can kind of uh, validate that because I witnessed that as well and I engage in that as a, a middle aged man, much to my uh, frustration about being middle aged, about running and the connection of physical health. So the ongoing conversation about uh, mental health and emotional well-being is very much to be welcomed because there's a further road to be traveled. And I was thinking about it in the context of where do we learn to be a man? And some of it, if not a lot of it, comes from our experience of being fathered and our relationship with our father or fathers. And I was thinking about it in the sense that nowadays it's also very common to see uh, young men as fathers pushing buggies or prams or whatever. Uh, and that mightn't have been the case maybe 15, 20 years ago. So I think that speaks to something culturally and very hopeful and helpful as well around uh, a societal change in that regard, uh, as, as we see it, you know, or as I see it, you know, around um, the suburbs where I live. So I think that's helpful and hopeful as we continue on this conversation together about the nation's mental health and from our perspective this afternoon, from a, from a man's perspective of it, of health and mental health. Great. Thanks, Stephen. And Keith? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, after this, go and find out about the word vulnerability. Find out what it means. Do as much research as you can. Uh, listen to all the podcasts. Just put the word vulnerability and in podcasts into Google. I think Brené Brown is one that writes books and has talks mm -hmm. and TED talks about, about vulnerability. What does it mean? Really look into what it means and try and discover who you really are and try. And that all leads into mindfulness, meditation, being, you know, in the moment. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, one of your former managers, Joe, used to talk about, you know, dealing with what's in front of you um, on the pitch, you know, just to, to just deal with what's in front of you. That's all you can do. And, and that, that all comes down to mindfulness and meditation and allowing yourself to be yourself in the moment and just deal with what you need to deal with and living each day. Um, just live each day. Don't worry about tomorrow. You know, it's easy to say, but the word vulnerability, research it. It'll be your friend, believe me. And and it takes a strong man to be vulnerable. Mm. Great. Thank you, Keith. And Joey. Yeah, um, I suppose being honest with yourself um, and knowing when something might not be completely fully right um, and being able to 
trust the people around you and trust the support systems you have and be able to ask and ask for help and have the strength to ask for help and I think is is massive and I think we can all definitely learn from that great and I'm just conscious of you know the strength it takes to ask for help but even more courage and strength to take help so Mm. um look I really want to thank each of you very very much for putting yourselves forward again you're talking as your individual person as a man to be continued and I just really like to say Gramila Mahogav Galer and Joey representing everybody who's watching this to wish you the very, very best out there in the rugby field. And we will be watching you. Mm-hmm. And Keith will be listening to your, web, your podcast. And Stephen, I'm just delighted to have you as a colleague and continue working with you. So Likewise, move, thank you. So to move to next week. So um, so to thank you also to thank the people who've attended. It's been really, really helpful. And apologies for those who I haven't got to your specific question. And next month, and it's just shocking how quickly the time is going by, but next month we are looking at brain imaging and mood and the role of the brain in mental health. And it's fascinating and it's an area that is evolving over and over. And we're very fortunate to be welcoming Dr. Derek Cannon, who's an expert in the whole area of the brain. And so I'm very much looking forward to having a conversation with her. If you'd like to stay up to date on our upcoming webinars, you can subscribe to AWARE's webinar mailing list, and that's on our website or via the follow-up email that you'll receive tomorrow. And the follow-up email will also include a link to allow you to watch back and share this webinar today, if you so wish. It will also be available on our YouTube channel, as are all past webinars. And just a reminder that unfortunately, AWARE can't take any more questions for the panel today, But if you do have questions or concerns about your health, we really strongly encourage you to to speak to your GP. And then for more information on AWARE and our services, visit aware.ie. So final word of thanks to Joey, to Steve and to Keith and wishing each of you the very, very best in your careers and your lives. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, Keith. Lovely conversation. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, guys.